Hello, I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm presenting some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. Here, I want to say some things about The Bluest Eye by the Nobel Prize winning author, Toni Morrison. The novel deals with painful subjects, poverty and violence, the trauma of living under a system of structural racism, and most importantly, incest and rape. An obituary for Toni Morrison upon her death in 2019 describes her writing this way. Her narratives mingle the voices of men, women, children, and even ghosts in layered polyphony. The bluest eye doesn't have ghosts, but it does have richly developed perspectives of men, women, and children. And its narrative voice is polyphonic. I'll suggest three tracks to follow through the novel. The first and most important is the tragic story of Pekula Breedlove, a 12-year-old girl psychologically damaged even as a child by the ubiquitous representation of beauty as a property of white people. Pekula imagines that if she only had blue eyes, she could be valued, honored, loved, appreciated. Often mistreated by other children, she thinks she is ugly. Eventually, she's raped by her own father. She has a miscarriage, and she's okay physically, but she doesn't recover psychologically. At the end of the novel, she has gone insane. She has sought the advice of a self-styled spiritual counselor, asking him to petition God to give her blue eyes. Indeed, he agrees, she believes him, and she grows up to become a familiar sight on the streets of this community in Lorraine, Ohio. A disturbed woman muttering to herself under the delusion that God really has granted her beauty and value. God really has granted her the bluest eye. A second track through the novel is a sort of Bildungsroman, coming of age plot, focused on the young Claudia McTeer, a schoolmate of Pecola Breedlove. Much of the novel is narrated in the first person by Claudia McTeer, sometimes with the limited consciousness and awareness of a young child, and sometimes with the reflective awareness of a grown woman looking back on the events of the story. The novel also deploys a third-person narrator using free indirect discourse to present the perspectives of several different characters, Pecola's parents, Charlie Breedlove, Pauline Breedlove, the three prostitutes who live in the apartment above the storefront where Pecola and her family live, and the spiritual advisor I mentioned earlier, whom members of the community call Soped Church. Throughout the novel, both in Claudia's first-person narrative and in these sections of third-person free and direct discourse, the novel presents a rich panorama of life in this community at this time and in this place. So those are the three tracks I suggest paying attention to. Pecola's story, Claudia's Bildungsroman narrative, and the tableau, the setting in which the story is played out. The narrative structure is complex, developed on multiple levels. At the highest level, there are four parts, each designated by a season of the year, beginning with autumn, then winter, spring, and summer. One effect of the novel's division into four parts named for the seasons is to emphasize the duration of time, a very important year, in the lives of these three young girls. Each of these four parts are divided into separate chapters, and each of them begins with a section of first-person narration by the young Claudia, before moving on to the omniscient third-person narrator, 
who fills in information that the young Claudia can't know. Each of the early chapters is prefaced by an epilogue, an excerpt from the Dick and Jane Readers, a primer for children beginning to read that was widely used throughout the United States in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. I'll read a few sentences. Here is the house. It is green and white. It has a red door. It is very pretty. Here is the family. Mother, father, Dick, and Jane live in the green and white house. They are very happy. So in the books, this narrative of a happy middle-class family would be accompanied by pictures of a white middle-class family, an idealized representation, somewhat different from the actual lives of children like Claudia and Frida and Pecola. But Morrison emphasizes the subconscious absorption of this ideal by these African-American children by first presenting the excerpt from the Dick and Jane reader in the normal way, then distorting the same text in subsequent presentations, first without any capitalization, then with capitalization, but without spaces between the words. These epilogues function as an ironic commentary on the ubiquitous standards of white value absorbed by these African-American children. Claudia has the gumption to resist this indoctrination. When she's given a white baby doll for Christmas, instead of nurturing it and loving it, she dislikes it, she dismembers it, much to the chagrin of the older generation. But Pecola embraces these white standards fully. She's insecure, she really believes she is ugly and unworthy, and she yearns to be transformed, to be given those blue eyes, the talisman of whiteness and of worthiness. When Pecola's father, Charlie, sets their house on fire, the family is split up temporarily. Pecola comes to live, briefly, with the family of Claudia and Frida. The three become friends, Claudia and Frida, sympathize with Pecola, and they recognize her insecurity. For example, they have a Shirley Temple cup that Pecola likes to drink out of. It's as though she associates drinking out of that cup with the white ideal represented in the movies by Shirley Temple. She likes it so much that she drinks too much milk, angering Claudia's and Frida's mother. But they don't betray her. They don't complain. They protect her. Another event that happens during the time that Pecola is staying with the McTeers is that she gets her first period. Claudia and Frida are in awe of her. Now she's a woman. She's just like a grown-up. She could have a baby. This scene is rendered as a charming glimpse into the preoccupations and concerns of these young girls and their limited understanding of what's going on. But it is also a foreshadowing of the fate that awaits Pecola. This tension between sexual awakening, sexual awareness, sexual desire, sexuality in general, on the one hand, and the prim and proper reticence about sex in the polite adult society is held in balance throughout the novel. Sex for these young girls is mysterious, and insofar as it is associated with adulthood, sex has an irresistible attraction, but it is also represented to them as dangerous. I'll relate one sequence that demonstrates this well. The McTeers take on a boarder, Mr. Henry Washington. He lives with them for a while. Eventually, though, he molests Claudia's older sister, Frida. He touches her breasts that are just beginning to develop. The children tell their mother their father chases Mr. Washington out of the house, and Claudia and Frida overhear one of the older neighbor women saying they should take her to the hospital to see for sure if she isn't ruined. Claudia and Frida have heard the term ruined in association with three prostitutes who live above the storefront apartment where Pecola and her family now live. These three prostitutes are Miss Marie, China, and Poland. Miss Marie is fat, and Claudia and Frida assume that being ruined means that 
Frida is now going to be fat. And yet, they reason, another prostitute called China is very skinny, and yet she is also ruined. Why is she not fat? They have heard that China drinks a lot of whiskey. And they conclude that China must be skinny, unlike Miss Marie, because she drinks whiskey. So, the obvious solution occurs to them. Frida has to drink whiskey. But of course, there's no whiskey in their house. They have no whiskey and no money to buy any. Where will they get whiskey? Well, they recall, Pecola's father, Charlie, drinks whiskey. They'll go to Pecola's house and get some whiskey. And so off they go. The children, no doubt, have heard someone using an agricultural metaphor in talking about birth. And they accept the symbolism. They take it, perhaps, half seriously. When they discover that Pecola is pregnant, they're concerned and hopeful that they can help her have a baby. They've heard some language about planting seeds and growing, and it so happens that this spring they are selling marigold seeds to neighbors, saving up their money, and their parents tell them that if they sell enough seeds, save enough money, they can get a bicycle. In a gesture of solidarity with Pecola, they make a pact. They decide to give up the prize of the bicycle and instead take some of their seeds and plant them, reasoning that their marigold seeds will come up, will blossom, and this will somehow support Pecola and her baby. As I mentioned earlier, though, Pecola miscarries, and Claudia's and Frida's marigold seeds don't come up that spring. Claudia tells us that they blamed each other. Maybe they planted the seeds too deep. Maybe they planted the seeds too shallow. Maybe not enough water. Maybe too much water. But the older Claudia, looking back, tells us that that was a barren year. No one's marigolds sprouted and grew that year. It wasn't their fault. As I hope this one brief example will show, the symbolism is interwoven throughout the novel to support a nuanced representation of the social and especially the psychological challenges in which these young black girls are growing up. There's a tragic ending. Pecola goes insane. She never comes to terms with the psychological damage of racism. And yet we have the perspective of Soped Church, the spiritual advisor who recognizes that she's disturbed and he decides to affirm that condition, to play along with her insanity. Reasoning with himself, I think, that in a white supremacist society in which a black person has to struggle every day in a never-ending and seemingly unwinnable battle, maybe it would be better, maybe one would be happier, simply embracing the insanity and living under the delusion that one had been transformed that God had granted whiteness. That, at least, is one way to read the ending. At the end of the novel, Morrison writes, Oh, some of us loved her, and Charlie loved her. I'm sure he did. He, at any rate, was the one who loved her enough to touch her, to envelop her, give her something of himself. But his touch was fatal, and the something he gave her filled the matrix of her agony with death. Love is never any better than the lover. Wicked people love wickedly. Violent people love violently. Weak people love weakly. Stupid people love stupidly. But the love of a free man is never safe. There is no gift for the beloved. The lover alone possesses his gift of love. The loved one is shorn, neutralized, frozen in the glare of the lover's inward eye. And now, when I see her searching the garbage... For what? The thing we assassinated? I talk about how I did not plant the seeds too deeply. How it was the fault of the earth, the land of our town. I even think now that the land of the entire country was hostile to marigolds that year. This soil is bad for certain kinds of flowers. Certain seeds it will not nurture. Certain fruit it will not bear. And when the land kills of its own volition, we acquiesce and say the victim had no right to live. We are wrong, of course, but it doesn't matter. It's too late. 
at least on the edge of my town, among the garbage and the sunflowers of my town, it's much, much, much too late. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. But as always, if you have questions or comments, send me an email. Thank you.